So welcome. Um, thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. And thank you, Senator Sanders, for making the time for this important conversation today and more so for all you do for Vermont, Vermonters um, in general. And as we will dive into deeply in this hour, um, all you do in service of our brave little state doing our part to mitigate and adapt to the intensifying global climate crisis. Um, I'm Johanna Miller. I lead the Energy and Climate Program at the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, one of the big privilege pieces of my job is helping to coordinate Vermont's grassroots volunteer-driven network of town energy committees under the VCAN umbrella. I'm here with my colleague, Ian, who you will um, hear from shortly. Um, and um, we're here with three local energy committee leaders who you are also going to hear from momentarily. But as you likely know, there are about 120 local energy committees across the state that are working in partnership with their municipalities and neighbors and other part partners to, to turn the climate challenge we face into job creating, health enhancing, equity um, improving opportunities. So many of you on today's webinar are doing incredibly important work um, uh, at the local level, whether you're on an energy committee, um, um, whether you're, if you're not on an energy committee, um, it's highly likely that you're joining us today because you recognize the moment we're in. Our collective global reliance on the combustion of fossil fuels is coming at a high cost to both people and the planet. Um, the resulting consequences um, largely borne by black, brown and frontline communities who have had little to do with creating the problem. And the problem is manifesting in increased droughts and intensifying floods and wildfires, extreme heat and far more. So, we are facing some significant challenges. It can feel overwhelming at times, but I feel deep gratitude to have um, real leaders like Senator Sanders um, and, and hope in front of us um, you know, today and in the coming weeks. Um, I think there's a real opportunity to shift and this could be a significant pivot point. We're gonna hear momentarily from Senator Sanders about the work underway um, to advance a bipartisan um, infrastructure deal and an accompanying um, reconciliation package. There was a big um, effort, um, a vote that moved forward yesterday in the House, which I have no doubt the Senator will um, give us details on in terms of advancing that bipartisan infrastructure bill. And again, the necessary reconciliation package that will go along with it. Um, so I think the congressional you know, endeavors are complicated and Senator Sanders is gonna get into that and clarify what it all means from his leadership perch. But what is clear is that this is really a critical moment in time. It's unclear what's gonna happen um, in the political landscape in next year's election, will the house turn? Um, but the science could not be more clear. Um, and the recent intergovernmental panel on climate change report really put a, even a far point on it. We're at a precipice, code red for humanity. This is the moment. It is also the biggest opportunity we have to change our trajectory and turn it into the job creating, you know, sort of the opportunity that it can be to reduce our collective reliance on fossil fuels. So that's true at the federal level. We're gonna hear momentarily from Senator Sanders about what that means and what we can do to support him in his leadership role. Um, at the state level, you probably are also aware this is a pivotal moment for us as well as we work. Um, we've stood up a climate council. That council is hard at work, working to craft and deliver an initial climate action plan by December, 2021. That's gonna outline the recommendations for now required progress. So. But the point of it is it's the synergy between the local leadership, the local work that we're gonna hear about momentarily, the state work, the federal work, and it all needs to, to really come together. And this is a moment. So really quick overview of our flow of the event. I'm gonna turn it over momentarily to hear from our good Senator. Then we're gonna hear briefly from three of Vermont's um, very active energy committees about the hard work that they're doing on community solar, weatherization, vehicle electrification, conservation, and far more. We're gonna have some time, we hope to have some Q&A with the good Senator. Many of you have submitted some very important questions we hope to get to. Um, but before I turn it over to Senator Sanders, I just wanted to say a sincere thank you to Senator Sanders and his team for making this event possible today, more so for all you do every day. 
um, for Vermonters and in service of so many important climate justice, economic justice, social justice initiatives. Thank you. I also want to give a big shout out to our partners at VPIRG for lending us the Zoom webinar platform to host this conversation and just turn it over to our good Senator who is leading the charge in these conversations and on these pivotal issues with um, is deep privilege to have you represented us, um, Senator Sanders, and we are grateful for what you do. And we are looking forward to the conversation now so we can figure out how we can partner and support you at this really pivotal moment. So Senator, thank you again and take it away. Okay, well, Joanna, um, thank you very much for the work you are doing. Let me thank all of the town energy committees. I love the concept of town energy committees. This is the kind of grassroots uh, activism that we're gonna need, not only in Vermont, but around this country to deal with what I think all of us recognize is an existential threat, not only to our state and our country, but to the entire planet. Um, <clears throat> you know, Joanna made the point, and I don't wanna go into great detail in repeating it, uh, but it is not just what the IPCC said and their code red alarm, uh, and they're telling us that we have a very, very few years in which to cut carbon or else we will see um, massive and permanent uh, structural problems in our country uh, and around the world, irreparable problems. And I think we are all united in the understanding that we have a moral responsibility to make sure that the planet, the country that we leave our kids and future generations is one that is healthy and is habitable. Um, I mean, I just want you all to think about what we have observed this past summer, just this past summer, last month, last two months. We got a huge fire in Siberia, Siberia of all places. It turns out to be a larger fire than all the other fires combined. Smoke from that fire is going 3,000 miles. Okay, the impact of that. Uh, you saw the horrible pictures in Greece, of Greece on fire. We all know what's going on in Oregon, in California. And all of you know that, air, this is unbelievable to me, air quality in Vermont, 3,000 miles away from Oregon has been impacted by those fires. In fact, if you look at the moon, you'll see that the tinge in the moon, that's from the forest fires. Uh, we saw the flooding in Germany and in Belgium, historic flooding. Italy, just a few weeks ago, experienced the hottest day ever recorded in Europe. Uh, July, this past July was the hottest July uh, ever recorded. And drought and extreme weather disturbances are having a massive impact on agriculture. We don't talk about that enough. It's not just forest fires. Farmers will not be able to produce the quality of food, the quantity of food they have historically uh, been uh, able to do in the United States and around the world. And around the world, that means increased hunger and turmoil. Uh, we are looking at rising sea levels, which in the not too distant future literally threaten uh, the existence of New York City, of Miami, Charleston, other coastal cities. That is the reality that we are looking at. That's the bad news. So let me tell you the good news, reasonably good news. <clears throat> and that is, we are right now working, as I think all of you know, on uh, a three and a half trillion dollar, what we call the reconciliation package. And I won't bore you with all of the incredibly arcane, and sometimes absurd rules that exist in the Senate, but it is a three and a half trillion dollar bill on top of the recently passed 550 billion so-called uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. That bill dealt mostly with traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, broadband, uh, also uh, some money into climate, I think into uh, improving our grid, grid improvements, which certainly uh, needs to be done. But the bill that we are working on, the three and a half trillion dollar bill will not be bipartisan. Sad to say, and it is sad, we have no Republican support, not in the House, not in the Senate. Uh, so the Democratic caucus is gonna have to do it alone. Um, and 
while I think a lot of attention has been paid to the social implications of this legislation in uh, extending the $300 child benefit that working class families are now getting, uh, it, it's greatly expanding uh, child care and making pre-K education for three or four year olds free, universal, uh, making community colleges, uh, two year community colleges free, building massive amounts of low income and affordable uh, housing, greatly expanding home health care, expanding Medicare to cover dental, eyeglasses, hearing aids. That in addition to all of that, which is profoundly important as social legislation, this legislation will put more by far into addressing climate than any piece of legislation in the history of the country. And we're talking about many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars. So let me talk a little bit. Now, uh, this is still a work in progress. You have six or seven separate committees working on their part uh, of the bills, but I can give you a general statement as to where we are heading. Uh, I can't give you all of the details because, you know, that is still being worked on. I hope, by the way, that we will have this done within a month, five weeks. Uh, there will be many billions of dollars going into uh, energy efficiency uh, and making our homes and buildings uh, much more energy efficient. And this is a real opportunity to create a whole lot of jobs. And one of the things that I want you all to think about, and we should be talking about, uh, in the discussion is the very serious problem of not having enough workers now to address many of the issues that we're talking about. And later on this afternoon, literally almost after I'm off this program, we'll be talking to some of the leaders in community colleges in Vermont and elsewhere about how we train uh, the workforce that we need to do, deal with climate, deal with healthcare, and many, many other issues. But keep that in the back of your mind. And any ideas you have on that would be sorely appreciated. I just had a uh, a press event in Waterbury at the um, uh, Crossenbrook uh, School, which has been very active in uh, sustainable energy. And we, we announced that we've got a million dollars coming into the state uh, for solar projects in schools and public buildings. Uh, and while there, I was talking to some people in the solar industry, and they just don't have enough uh, workers to do solar installation. So we need to work on that. Uh, this legislation will, in a variety of ways, uh, provide massive uh, funding for wind, solar, and other sustainable energies. Uh, probably the most unique and interesting aspect of what we're doing will be the electrification of transportation in America. And that means there will be very significant uh, rebates uh, to help uh, working class, middle class families be able to purchase electric uh, vehicles, a whole lot of money going into research and development in terms of battery technology and so forth. Uh, agriculture is an important part of what we're trying to do. Uh, how do we create a greener agriculture uh, in terms of climate? Uh, there will be maze, uh, massive investments in that. Uh, there'll be massive investments in climate resiliency and uh, ecosystem recovery projects. A lot of money will go into water, clean water. Uh, environmental justice. Uh, we are going to spend uh, money, uh, many billions, trying to deal with the crises our oceans and water systems are facing, the acidification of the ocean. And one of the projects that I have been working on, along with some leadership in the House and the Senate, and I'm very excited about it, is what we call a Civilian Climate Corps. And we think we're going to put about $30 billion into that over a five-year period which will mean that many hundreds of thousands of young people from all across this country will be able to get the training that they need to help us address uh, the climate crises that we face. That means, you know, going from weatherizing homes to fight, fighting uh, forest uh, fires uh, and to doing everything else uh, in between. Uh, so I want you to understand uh, that, um, this bill is unique and unprecedented in what it will do for climate. Uh, what I hope uh, we can go to now, we're going to hear from some speakers. And, you know, my hope is that Vermont can play a leadership role 
in transforming our energy system. And it is terribly important. And I don't think we're there yet. You know, if this state, you know, we just brought in $1.4 billion for transportation. We're gonna bring in a whole lot more money for climate over a period of years. Are we prepared? Do we, and I know Joanna was talking about working on priorities, but are we prepared? Money, large sums of money come into the state. What are we going to do with that money? Do we have the workforce to do it? Uh, and we need those projects lined up. I would hope very much that this state, which has always been ahead of the curve on environmental issues in general, uh, will become a model for the rest of the country and maybe the world in what we can do in transforming uh, our uh, energy systems and making us much more energy efficient. So uh, that is a little bit uh, about what we are trying to do in Washington. I hope that we will have this thing done and a vote on the floor uh, four or five weeks. And, uh, and then we're gonna start dispensing the money and getting to work to try to save the planet. So uh, um, that's just what I wanted to say, Joanna. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for all you do in that update. And we look forward to doing whatever we can to support you and your colleagues who are gonna be bold enough and look at the opportunity in this transition through the lens of economic development and equity and justice. It is critically important. And echoing your enthusiasm for the role of local leadership and the, the partnership of our communities in this transition, we're gonna turn it over to a few local leaders who are doing great work in their communities in very different ways um, to highlight some of the successes and priorities that they have and some of the challenges that they're um, encountering as they work to make this transition do their part. I'm gonna turn it over first to Jeff Dexter, who is the chair of the Sunderland Energy Committee. Um, Sunderland and Jeff and his leadership and their team there have been doing a lot of work in a variety of different arenas. So Jeff, tell us a little bit more about what you are up to. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Uh, and thank you all for this opportunity to share accomplishments and goals with other Vermonters uh, that are, who are concerned about climate change. And I have to say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say being on a panel with Senator Sanders has got to be one of the real honors, the real highlights of my life. So thank you for, for being with us, Senator. Uh, our energy committee in Sunderland is, is relatively new. We've been doing this for about two years now. We've got six active members, which is important. Anyone who's been on a committee, you can have people on name only, but this group is a very good group uh, doing a lot of good things. Uh, it also includes, I'm proud to say, a local student who's a junior at Burn Burton Academy. Uh, as Senator Sanders said early, getting the youth involved is very, very important. And that's one of our challenges. And that's why we're, we're happy and both proud to, uh, to have uh, this person on our committee. Uh, like a lot of committees, we are the clearinghouse of information via our town web page and our uh, Facebook page uh, for information uh, for local residents, businesses, other government groups. Uh, we act as a partner in, in sharing that information about all of the various uh, resources that are out there. And that's one of the great things. Uh, yes, this is a a daunting uh, project we all have in front of us, but there are a great number of resources and it's so important to get that information out. So we, we whittle it down to the local level here and get that out to people, constantly updating it. And um, we, we also use our forum to, uh, to increase awareness on the issue of, uh, of climate change, because as you most, as many of you do know, we have to sometimes prove that this is definitely real, that the science does uh, show us that this has been around for a while, it is man-made, and it is something that now we have to deal with very quickly. We cannot keep kicking the can down the road. So as I said, this is part of our, our clearinghouse of information is also delving into that part of the issue. Uh, some of the resources that we share with others are the, both hands-on resources, which I'll talk about in a second, and also the financial resources available through the state of Vermont, uh, Efficiency Vermont, as we all know, they have a great number of programs, Green Mountain Power, uh, the, the utility in our area, 
and through the federal resources that are available, uh, mostly the uh, the income tax uh, credits and rebates and things. So uh, things that we're planning uh, in terms of hands-on are seminars on e-cars, e-bikes, and electric uh, equipment for the garden. Uh, a number of other committees around the town, around the state, I should say, have done this, and we want to now piggyback on what they're doing and, and get our people coming to our town hall and, and uh, viewing e-cars, e viewing the e-bikes and viewing the equipment to see just how much they can benefit from this, uh, in addition to using that as an opportunity for local vendors, car dealers, bike dealers, and uh, landscape stores. To, uh, to sell their, their products. Uh, as we all know, a lot of this hinges on it being shown as an economic boost to people, that it uh, positively hits their, uh, their pocketbooks and their wallets uh, in a way that, yes, it's important to do for the community, for the, for the state and for the world, but it also can benefit you uh, financially. Uh, be that as it may, that is you know, a reality. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is how proud we are of our current project called Window Dressers. Many of you may know what that is. It's a uh, Maine-based group. It's a nonprofit based in Maine that um, all of the energy committees in Bennington County are involved with putting on two community builds, as they call them, in early November. One will be in Bennington, one will be in Arlington. Uh, you know, we all talk about the, the, the articles that we can read, the preaching to the choir, the protests, the petitions, things like that. But to me, this is a real rubber hits the road type project where we are going to help people affordably build window inserts to knock down on those drafts that we all feel in the winter from many of our windows and our, our aging housing stock. Um, it, it'll save people money. It cuts down on fuel use, very important. And it makes those buildings much more comfortable and efficient. So that, that as I said, is something that a lot of uh, energy committees throughout the state now in Vermont are doing. It started in Maine. They've built about 40,000 of these window inserts over the last 10 years. And we're proud to be a part of that. So that's a, a brief overview of what we're doing. And, and the last thing I want to mention is some of the challenges that we face. And as Senator Sanders noted, uh, the availability, the feasibility of electric vehicles is extremely important. Uh, getting that price down, getting the range of mileage uh, much higher, uh, dealing with public transport, transportation uh, vehicles and getting them out on the roads, and then the infrastructure that's going to handle all this, uh, specifically battery charging stations. I was glad that uh, Senator Sanders noted how much money is involved with that. Uh, in this upcoming bill, and hopefully a lot of that does get down to the communities. Uh, the next, the last, second thing is getting green energy companies into Vermont. Senator Sanders also mentioned that, uh, possibly making Vermont the green energy capital of the world, like Silicon Valley was to uh, computer chips and Michigan was to cars back in the early part of the last century. Uh, there's no reason why this can't be an exciting beginning of having green energy, the green economy start here in Vermont and then spread throughout the, uh, the nation and through the world. Uh, the last thing I'll mention again, as I said, getting the youth involved. And I know the Vermont Energy Education Program is very active in that. We wanna get more involved with our local school by teaching people, uh, you know, young people, just how important it is uh, for them to get involved, because I'll probably be long gone when, when this really hits the fan. Uh, but we really want to, uh, you know, let them know they've got to pick up the ball at a young age and run with it. Okay, uh, Jeff, let me interrupt you by saying what I, I we want to keep remarks brief because I would like a little bit of a discussion. Okay, uh, afterward. So Je Jeff, thank you for all the great work you're doing and for being with us. Right now, I think uh, Joanna Allison is uh, up next. Yeah, I'm going to turn it over to Allie Webster. She's a member of the Peachum Energy Committee. Peachum is a, is a very rural town, and this committee has been focused on a, a, a wide variety of really important different strategies. So Allie, tell us a little bit briefly about what you are up to. Sure, thank you. And it is it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much to Senator Sanders and VCAN for organizing 
Um, we have got a variety of things going on. Last year, we launched a home energy audit campaign where we were able to provide subsidized energy audits at $50 cost to 20 of our households in town. So that was through um, that was through funding provided by, by our town government. And we knew that we have a number of energy burdened households in town. That means they're paying a disproportionate amount of their income on their energy bills. And we really wanted that energy audit campaign to be targeted towards those community members that needed it most. And we hoped it would spur weatherization work in our older housing, housing stock. So I'm sure this is similar to a lot of historic towns in Vermont, but nearly half of the homes in Peachum were built before 1940. So that's prime candidates for home energy efficiency, but we really have been trying to drive home the message of increased comfort and health along with saving money. So we had a great uh, partnership with Heat Squad and NeighborWorks to make that possible. They normally provide home energy audits for $150. And so thankfully with the budget from the town, we were able to bring it down to $50. And Heat Squad was a great partner because there was not a conflict of interest with them uh, providing, doing the weatherization work after the fact. They just come in, they do a very comprehensive energy audit with the complete blower door test and then give the homeowner that priority list of tiered recommendations of how to take the next step and get their homes more comfortable and saving money. So we're up to 15 audits that we've been able to provide out of the 20 that we have. And um, I think we still have a lot of work to do now. It's kind of the hard part of getting them to follow up on the recommendations they've received in these very comprehensive reports. And you know, our original goal was to reach the most energy burdened community members in town. And I think that that is also something where we have a lot of work to do and having building that trust there and starting those conversations. So um, we are working on that and we're trying to find more community partners that will help us reach those that need or want the resources as much as possible. And then on the, to switch gears a little bit oh, on elect, so on the, um, and the EV work that we've been doing in town, we hosted an all electric future fair this summer. And that was really to, try to get people to imagine themselves with in, in the all electric future. So we had neighbors and friends bring out mowers, electric bikes, chainsaws, you name it, lawn equipment, and then a variety of different electric vehicles for them to kind of get the look and feel of things. And uh, it was a great community building opportunity. People had a chance to ask questions and uh, think about what electric gear might make sense in their lives. And we have a handful of EVs in town, but we currently lack any public charging stations. And so that currently is just an issue of funding for us. So we would love to be able to have a public charging station, uh, but unfortunately it's not something that our town budget can handle. And there are programs that are out there, but it seems like it's more geared towards larger businesses and not small groups like our nonprofits that might want to host one. Um, so that's been a challenge for us as well. And then the other big project that we're hoping to get off the ground is an affordable community scale solar project. So we're hoping to do 150 KW system. We have a wonderful family in town that is willing to share their land to set up this system and the power would actually help go toward providing the lowering the electricity needs of our town buildings, our fire department, and potentially some of the nonprofits in town. And then we could sign up 20 more households to be tapped into this local energy source. Um, we are, we know that there's red tape to be aware of, and we know that we have, um, we've got to get a lot of people on board, including PUC and the Green Mountain Power as well. And again, equity, we really want equity to be at the top and front of mind here. So we want to make sure that those households that want to sign up have the ability to tap into the local community source. And um, I think back for what, what's something that could happen at the state level, but also is tied into federal policy. I mean, we need a renewable energy standard that's at 100% right now. I think that's going to help drive um, more community scale local solar production because currently it's a little over 50% and we, you know, having it reach 75% by 2035 is not going to cut it. And uh, we, we see that as one of the obstacles to having more community scale solar. And we also have two utilities in town. We have both Green Mountain Power and Washington Electric. 
And that um, poses an issue too, when some of our utilities are already um, labeling themselves as 100% renewable, but much of that renewable power is coming from hydro, big hydro projects like Hydro Quebec. And so that doesn't encourage more local solar or wind production in communities like ours. Okay, thank you very much, Allison. Yeah, thank you, Ali. I think you're highlighting some of the themes that are also coming in, Senator Sanders, just so you know, through the chat related to, you know, how do we help these all volunteer networks of energy committees, you know, support them, build capacity at the local level for implementing these projects. And I think some of the things that you're also highlighting, Ali, are conversations that we're having in the Vermont Climate Council. So um, I'm looking forward to this ongoing conversation with you all figuring out how do we partner with a good senator and ideally a federal leadership um, to do more of what you all are doing and what Richard Boots and his team in Bristol are doing. Um, Richard is a member of the Bristol Energy Committee and they've been collaborating with the Acorn Energy Co-op on a 500 kilowatt um, community solar project. Richard, tell us a little bit about that and then we'll turn it back to the Senator and we'll get into some questions, but want to highlight and celebrate what you are doing there locally. Richard. Thank you, Johanna, and thank you, Senator. This is indeed a privilege. Uh, when I moved to Vermont 10 years ago, one of my real thrills was to be able to vote for you for Senator. So uh, I'm real pleased to be here. Uh, Bristol had, a, an op had an opportunity in that our landfill uh, was taken out of service and capped. And uh, it turns out that it's in a hollow. It's out of sight of homes and highways. And uh, it's also uh, on a south facing slope. And so our Bristol Energy Committee was uh, very easily able to make this a preferred site for solar. And the chair of our energy uh, program, Sally Burrell, mm -hmm began to contact uh, community solar providers to see if there was any interest in uh, setting up uh, as large a, a field as possible uh, in this site. And uh, through a process, we selected the Acorn Energy Co-op to build the 500 kW uh, project. And one thing I would say, particularly to Allison, as you're uh, proceeding on this is that it really, really helps to have uh, experienced people guiding you. ACORN has done two of these community uh, solar projects prior to ours successfully in Middlebury and down in Salisbury. Uh, we're the largest one so far at 500, but uh, they know the process and how to get through the PUC and the federal regulators. And they have um, guided us very smoothly. In addition to that, um, the um, ACORN is locally owned and Bristol residents have been guaranteed 40% of the solar uh, available in this project right from the very beginning. And what that did was it really smoothed the transition through the select board process. And we managed to move through uh, without any opposition whatsoever, partly because of the location and partly because it's a local uh, energy project. In addition to that, um, it's a kind of project that will enable people who cannot install solar panels on their house or property to participate because the solar panels are on the landfill. And that means that condo owners and even renters can participate in this project because even if they move within the Green Mountain Power area, uh, they can transfer their credits. And uh, that's, really, that's a really big draw. Uh, on my street in Bristol, uh, there are houses that cannot uh, except solar panels with any efficiency. So uh, it's a great project for those people. Um, so what were the, the problems we ran into? We started out uh, subscribing actually right in the middle of the COVID pandemic. 
and the uncertainty, uh, economic uncertainty, and the um, the kind of problems that people were having just coping with the with the pandemic certainly had an impact on acceptance. I know it had an impact on the faith communities that we were hoping would sign up. Uh, Vermont Interfaith Power and Light and the Addison County uh, Climate Action Network were hoping to involve churches that often have very high energy bills uh, to participate. But the churches, most of the churches were closed and were very, are very uncertain about their economics right now. And so I think that was a, that was a headwind that, uh, that, we, that we faced that nobody would have, would have predicted when we began this project. The other thing is that's been kind of mentioned before is uh, Vermont is trying to move toward economy of scale in their solar projects. And what that's done is it has de-emphasized the smaller community solar projects. And so the PUC and the state have allowed the solar adder uh, to drop to what is now one cent. When I put my panels on eight years ago, it was six cents. And at the end of this year, it'll be zero. Um, and I think that is uh, a problem, but I, I'm suggesting that there might be a solution to that problem. And that is uh, maybe divorcing ourselves from this kind of system that's very complicated. And what I'm wondering about, if we shouldn't use the model of uh, buying an electric car. For example, my daughter bought an electric car on Monday. She had so many incentives that the price of the car came down fifteen thousand uh, dollars. It's unbelievable what's available right now, and the reason it's so easy is that these things are all sourced at the dealer and the manufacturer. And so, would it be possible, say, at the federal level, to subsidize the solar cost of the solar panels? So right from the get-go. Uh, the solar panels themselves are much less expensive and you don't have to have a regulatory Richard, I'm going to jump in and interrupt you and apologize okay. for that. Uh, but we have, I think, a number of questions out there and I've got some questions uh, that I wanted to ask. So I apologize. Sure. No problem. I, I wanted to, to move this thing along. Look, uh, let me say to Ali, uh, I'm a great fan of the Heat Squad and all the great work they did in uh, the Addison County Rutland area. Uh, I think we got them a half a million dollars uh, to continue their work up in the Northeast Kingdom. So they'll have some more resources. All right, it seems to me, and I think, you know, Richard was making this point and Jeff as well. I, I think uh, sometimes uh, we complicate things too much and we don't have time uh, for complication. We don't have time for bureaucracy. Yep. We're gonna have to move very, very quickly in this crisis and break through a lot of the crap that has existed for years. Now, Richard, you talk about incentives. There are going to be massive incentives. We're still working out the details uh, for electric cars. Um, we are going to extend the that 7,500, which expired for a number of automobile manufacturers. That's going to be extended. Plus, if the car was made in America, probably another 2,500. If it's union made, more benefits on top of that. So you're going to see. Yeah. Uh, electric cars very very competitive competitive with internal combustion cars. Uh, you talked about EV charging stations. They have billions of dollars coming in to uh, you know make sure that we can uh, charge the the cars and people can travel uh, efficiently. Uh, I wanted to ask a question, and anybody can answer it. My impression is, and, and please tell me what I'm missing here and tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, I share with Richard, by the way, this concern, and I want people, maybe let's stay on that issue, uh, for, with the PUC uh, making incentives for solar uh, less and less and eventually nothing. I'm not clear that I understand why that is so. 
when we are all talking about the need to aggressively move to sustainable energy, yeah. we can put solar up on our rooftops. Why is the PUC making that less uh, attractive for people to do? Thoughts on that? Bernie I, Bernie, I had lunch during a, a VCAN conference with a PUC member, and she told me that they felt that there had been enough incentives, that, that solar didn't need them anymore. I almost fell out of my chair. Uh, I don't know if that's a total reason, but that seemed to be... That, it was, that solar is now mature. Was that the word used? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I, I don't understand that myself, and I will talk to the PUC. We're talking about saving the planet yes, and not uh, determining, uh, you know, talking about an energy transition and not determining, you know, whether solo companies can make money or not make money. So I don't understand that. And that's something I, I, I will look at. Uh, the other thing, and, and uh, Ali, raised, Ali raised this, um, we have brought in some money and I hope to bring in a lot, lot more money for weatherization of homes. Mm -hmm. So I guess when you talk, uh, Ali, and correct me if I'm wrong about an energy audit, you go to a home and you say you're wasting energy here, there, and the other place. And if you do A, B, and C, you can cut your energy costs by whatever, 30%, 40%. Uh, is that what you're trying to do? Yeah, they get a comprehensive report that says you need air sealing here, you need insulation there, you need to replace windows. Windows, right. Okay, yeah. now the question is that I think you implied is it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to come up with the fifteen dollars or $20,000 that you need to do it, right? Exactly, they're big ticket okay. items. It's expensive to do the work and move forward. All right, do you have the impression, and everybody else can jump in on this, that if we worked on a system which says that we're going to cut your fuel bill by whatever it may be, let's hypothetically say 50%, that we're going to loan you the 15000 or 20000 you need to do the job, and you will pay it back by the savings that you, were, you uh, uh, incurred through the weatherization for X number of years, and then you're going to be able to save money. Is that an approach that you think people would respond to? I, I absolutely think so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it comes down to an economic issue for, for people and, and that's an innovative way to, to go about you know, allowing them to have the money to do it. So you're not gonna be spending any more than you were spending and after you pay it back, pay the loan back at a right. very low interest rate, you're gonna be benefiting from the uh, savings. Does that make sense to people? Ernie, what if, what if they paid it back in such a way that they gained a little bit no. right away. I think that's right. I yeah. think that's exactly right, Richard. Yeah, that sounds like the pay as you save model, which I think could really work. I know that there was a report that came out from the Center for Research and Public Policy that showed about the people were less interested in, in, in financing these projects and they would rather pay out of pocket for them. So I think that's also part of the issue, especially when we're trying to reach energy burdened households and I think personally, our experience, it would be more successful if we could say, we know the homes are old and this is old housing stock pre 1940s. Everybody needs insulation. Everybody needs air sealing. The money should be going directly to fund those projects off the ground, maybe with an audit, without an audit, we know it needs to be done. Okay. And you can, I mean, the beauty of this is I think everybody has said we could create a lot of jobs right. doing that. You save people money, you cut carbon emissions. If that's not a win-win-win situation, I'm not quite sure uh, what is. All right, I want to also say that I am concerned. I, I shared um, a Richard's, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, about uh, disincentivizing solar. We intend to bring in, we've got a project uh, called a revolving loan uh, rooftop solar project, which does exactly the same thing as the weatherization program I talked about. We will lend you the money uh, you will pay it back at no higher cost, maybe less than you were previously paying on your electric bill. And at the end of 10 years, you're going to be able to cut your electric cost. You know, you'll have it all paid back and you're going to get more or less free electricity. Yeah. That makes sense to people? Yep. All right. Yes. So that's, okay. Uh, Joanna, I think some questions have been coming in. Am I right? 
So Senator Sanders, there are so many questions, lots of good ideas. <laughs> we want to get to so many of them. Um, and if do we it. don't, then we're going to follow up. But Ian, take it away with the questions that came in via the Google chat first, and then some of these. Thank you all very much. And thank you for being with us, Senator. And folks, please do keep those questions coming in. The first one that we had that came up from a lot of folks is um, what can Vermonters and from our perspective, organizations like the NRC do to help ensure that the historic reconciliation bill, the Build Better, Build Back Better Act passes? Or as uh, Ryan from Sharon put it, Bernie, how can we help you help all of us? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I will be going on Friday to Indiana, Saturday to Michigan, and Sunday to Iowa to do just that. Those are in Iowa and Indiana, not Michigan. Uh, you have four Republican senators who have chosen not to support the, the package. Look, um, you know, in Vermont, uh, Senator Lee and Congressman Welch are strongly supportive of what we're trying to do here. Uh, but if you can reach out to friends around the country, uh, where there are uh, Republican uh, senators and maybe more conservative uh, Democratic senators, uh, that would be great. Um, you know, uh, as of now, we have no Republican support, and I think we have to make the case uh, that climate change is an existential threat and that the United States government has got to lead the world. And I know that you all know what complicates what we are trying to do is this is not an American issue, it's a global issue. And China is a significantly worse emitter than we are. And we're not gonna have success unless we bring China and Russia and Pakistan and India and the other heavy emitters into the process. But we can lead the world. Uh, I just talked to the uh, Chinese ambassador a few days ago and you know, it's just terribly important uh, that the major emitters of the world uh, cooperate. All right, what else we got, Joanne? That was a good question. Another one here, Senator, uh, from Dan in Burlington. How do we ensure that investments take into account equity and inclusion and are true just transition investments? And following on on that, Liz asks, how do we ensure that a just transition is true for working people, including provisions for good union jobs? Good. Uh, you'll be happy, Liz will be happy to know that you know throughout uh, this uh, proposal, and the president has been very strong about this, uh, that we want not just jobs, but we want good paying jobs. And when possible, we want union jobs. I'm just talking, as I mentioned earlier in Waterbury today to a guy who is involved in, in a solar installation. He tells me that right now they don't have enough workers. They are paying starting salaries at 20 bucks an hour plus benefits. Um, but th that, that point is, is well taken. We want these jobs to be uh, well-paying and, and union jobs. And obviously, look, when you talk about having working families benefit from this, I mean, I, you all know this. I mean, I'm talking to the, to the choir here. Everybody has got to be involved. What does it matter if you're rich or whether you're poor? Everybody has got to be involved in saving energy and in, you know, I think we would agree in producing energy. Uh, so, we are working on one project, and there are many in there. This is one that I've introduced, as I mentioned, the revolving loan fund. So that would say it, it would help homeowners uh, be able to get solar on their roofs, get the down payment, and pay it off over years at low interest rates. Uh, and also provide for, I think somebody mentioned, maybe, I don't know, it was Jeff or, or somebody, Allison uh, uh, or Richard, a community-based uh, solar as well. Right. So if I'm a renter, I, I may not be able to put a solar panel, although how you deal with landlords and make it attractive to them to do it is another issue. Yeah. Uh, but this is one where uh, everybody has got a benefit and, and you know, we got to become more efficient and produce electricity. So it's across the board. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Tom from Burlington would like to know. How can we get the major polluters who have knowingly caused the climate crisis to help pay for the cleanup yeah. and building on that? Susan from Randolph asks that since folks who've caused the most climate damage were also some of the biggest climate deniers, how can we help them pay for the expenses of some of the climate related tragedies that they are culpable for creating? Good. Tom and Susan have asked a, a very good question and, and I share their concern. Look, I think we all know in life, people make mistakes. 
I make mistakes, you make mistakes. And we do things that later on we learn was a mistake. But in terms of some of the major fossil fuel players, it is not a situation where they just learned yesterday, oh my God, we didn't know. Uh, carbon emissions causes climate. I think all of you are familiar with some of the work done, I think by ProPublica and others, revealing that uh, getting the documents from ExxonMobil, where their scientists, some of their leading scientists decades ago, I think somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, back in the 70s. Yeah. Back yeah. in the 70s were saying, hey, you know what? What we are doing is going to warm the planet with incredible damage. That's what they were. And uh, ExxonMobil and other deniers put millions of dollars trying to obfuscate the issue and lie about the issue. Bottom line is, I agree with the question. I am on a bill uh, introduced by Senator Markey, I think, of uh, Massachusetts, which would fine them, which would demand exactly, I think we're talking about $500 billion. These guys have caused the problem. They made money by causing the problem, and they got to pay for that. I mean, this is really criminal activity in my, in my mind. It is all the difference in the world about not knowing what you're doing. We could forgive ignorance, but when they knew what they were doing, making money off of that, that is a crime they got to pay, in my view. We did that with the tobacco companies. Yeah, exactly. That is the analogy. Uh, Joanna, uh, Ian, you have other questions? A few more. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can here. Um, folks being municipal energy committees are obviously interested in how any prospective federal funding might get down to the state Good. and town level. Yeah. Um, Stephen from Barry asks if the bill can fund grants for schools and towns and state buildings for things like solar and battery storage and EV chargers. And yes. related to that, Darren from Essex Junction wants to know, how will that funding actually be structured to make it easy for municipalities to obtain and use it? All right. Uh, I don't know all the answers to that, and there are a number of different provisions. Um, but we are trying, if I have anything to say about it, because if there's anything in the world that I hate is complexity and bureaucracy. We are trying to make this stuff simple. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of electric automobiles, the goal here is, and I think we are there, is for people to get their rebates at point of sale. So you don't have to get it, you know, as a tax uh, rebate, but you get it right there. Now, then you got to deal with the companies and make sure the companies are not ripping off people, raising prices, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that would be fairly simple. Uh, I think by and large, most of the programs, and I don't know that we can do it too differently, uh, there will be money going to the states. And if the money goes to the states, and I very much want to see the town energy committees play an active role, uh, it will, you know, you're not going to have to travel to Washington to deal with the Washington bureaucracy. You can deal with Montpelier, which should be a lot easier. But the goal, obviously, would be to get the money. Uh, you know, I just dealt with um, the state this morning. We, we're going to get a million dollars for solar uh, panels uh, for schools and public buildings. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that money gets this is an easy process. People apply, get the money out, let's do it. Uh, but I think a lot of the money will be going into maybe larger cities, uh, into the states to give people the opportunity to get their hands on uh, that money and get it into the communities. Thank you, Senator. We'll try to fit a few more questions in here. Joey, feel free to chime in if and when we need to pivot on. Um, this question from Guy from Saxton's River pertains to kind of meeting the upfront cost of many of the things that we talk about for climate solutions. His example is weatherization, but I think this could be applied to everything from you know solar panels to electric vehicles. When he asks, right. upfront costs for weatherization projects and you know climate projects generally are a huge impediment for folks to move forward. And how will this three point five trillion dollars help? Well, that's exactly what I was talking about. I agree with Guy, and that is the impediment. And what we have got to do, again, in a simple way, hypothetically, I remember many years ago, uh, the low income, you're all familiar with the low income weatherization program, which in Vermont does a good job, but they are underfunded and we want to expand that. We want to expand similar type programs. But I remember going to a house in Barrie, an old house, uh, and uh, it had been weatherized 
two old sisters were living there, their 80s, 90s, whatever. And they their elect their fuel bill was cut in half. The home was made more comfortable, their fuel bill was cut in half. So I think what we have got to do, because upfront for working families, lower income families, is the impediment. We got to get the money to them in either grants or low interest loans, depending on their income. And they will repay it through the savings that they are incurring through weatherization or the production of electricity. But that is, that is exactly what I'm talking about. And that is, to me, the most important thing. People understand that they're wasting energy. They don't have the money to do the efficiency work or the weatherization work that they need. We got to get them that money, got to get that work done, and it can be paid back. Or if they're lower income, there will be grants to do it. Appreciate that, Senator. And definitely, I think the interest in, in equity and ensuring that the transition is, in fact, just and that low income folks aren't left behind is something that right. folks in this network are very interested in. Um, I think what I'll make our final question before closing remarks is I think something that people are asking more and more is things like the IPCC report come out that really spell out just how dire the climate crisis is. Um, and I think people would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, can what Vermont does, this small little state, to address climate change actually make a difference? Yes. Look, um, I mean, again, you know, we're all preaching to the choir. We would not be on this webcam if we didn't understand the dire nature of the climate crisis. And, you know, I think that not just through the work of activists and organizations, but because people are now seeing things with their own eyes. I mean, when you look at what goes on in Oregon or California or Europe or Siberia, you can't deny this, uh, this terrible reality. Um, what is very difficult, I, I, I fear, and this will be our job, is to make clear the urgency of the moment. This is not something that we have decades to do. We have got to do it and do it now. And uh, we have got to bring, you know, you know, China and, and other countries into this process. Uh, we are in this, you know, we are all in this together and the world is in it together. And you ask about what Vermont can do. Well, look, uh, the truth of, of the matter is in a world which is getting smaller and smaller, in a world in which, you know, we are communicating, you know, via Zoom and it's going on a million times a day, the innovative work that a small state does, if Vermont can show real, real progress in all of the areas that we've talked about, in weatherization, uh, in transportation, in creating solar and wind and other forms of sustainable energy. And if we can show that up, trust me, people all over the world, all over the country will be saying, hey, look, Vermont did that. Let's learn something. Just as we have got to learn from the good things that other folks in, in America and around the world are doing. It is a small world in that sense. The goal is to steal everybody's good ideas. And in climate uh, work, we've got to be very aggressive about that. So it would give me nothing more, and I know I speak for all of you, greater satisfaction than that our small state leads the country and becomes a model for what states can be doing. Uh, we have got to prevail on our legislature, on the governor, on the uh, uh, PUC, <coughs> uh, that there is a crisis and we got to be aggressive about it. But I am at least happy to tell you that with a little bit of luck, uh, there is some significant uh, developments taking place in Washington. And if we can pass this damn thing, uh, which I am working night and day, uh, it will give you guys the resources to start making the changes that we need. Senator Sanders. We are with you. We are here to support you in these next several weeks because we. I feel this is it. Like this is a moment. I feel like this is our moment to seize it. So we look forward to partnering with you. There are so many more good questions and comments. We will save what is in the chat and share them with your team so that you hear the comments you see and read those comments as you are able. And we very much appreciate your leadership. You working tirelessly. We hear you on what we can do, and we're going to partner as we can and. 
deep gratitude. There's a huge opportunity and certainly a moral obligation. So, my, jo Joanna, my thanks to you and all the great work that the town committees are doing to all of you who are on the panel today and to everybody who's watching. All right, we're in this thing together. Yes, we are. Go forward. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you all.